Sally Osberg triggered in me a, a recollection that serves as a preamble for what I'd like to say. It was 10 after 2 on the morning of December the 10th, 1948, when Eleanor Roosevelt wrote on a scrap of paper beside her, the long, hard job done. And she was right, of course, because they had finished the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I'd like to talk about one part of the human rights aftermath. In February of 2006, in response to direct requests from governments, Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, announced the formation of what was called the High Level Panel on System-Wide Coherence, dealing with UN reform in the areas of development, humanitarian assistance, and environment. For the United Nations, believe it or not, that was a particularly mellifluous title. <laughs> the appointment of the panel came in the immediate wake of Kofi Annan promising a few weeks earlier that all UN panels and commissions thereafter would reflect gender equality. The panel in question gave a slight twist to the notion of gender parity by appointing 12 men and three women. It's safe here to use the vernacular. All hell broke loose. <laughs> Kofi Annan's promise, having gone up in smoke, courtesy of his misogynist advisors, was the trigger for calling attention to the UN's deplorable record on gender. As it happens, my co-director in AIDS Free World, Paula Donovan, had put forward the year before, for the first time in the annals of multilateralism, the proposition that the UN should have an international agency for women. The argument was clear. There were agencies for everything else under the UN sun, from children to food to health to labor, but never an agency for women. As a result, women were forever the second-class paupers of the UN system. At the time the proposal was made, it was greeted with incredulity by some and derision by others. The United Nations create a new agency 60 years later? Preposterous. Except that, as a result of the panel, not so preposterous after all. The cry for a new women's agency gathered voice and momentum, and a plan developed amongst those committed to gender equality to force the panel's hand. It was a two-pronged strategy. A coalition of women's groups would caress the establishment with the usual blandishments, while AIDS Free World would engage in high-level advocacy at the diplomatic level. We shamelessly used the veneer of male privilege to gain access. But we needed a blazing dossier. We got it. Paula wrote a searing analysis of the UN's history on women's issues titled Gender Equality Now or Never. Not only did it dismember the dismal UN record on gender, but it actually became the blueprint for the General Assembly resolution on which a new agency was eventually based. We circulated it to all members of the panel. In fact, to use the word circulated is to diminish the overall intensity of the barrage. We lobbied individually, relentlessly, every single member of the panel. We attended their public meetings, we haunted their emails, we brought their most influential friends into the advocacy equation, we met with them secretly in conspiratorial coffee shops over lactose-free latte uh, to persuade them to do what was right, we made it impossible for the demand for a women's agency to be overlooked. Remember, a women's agency had not been on the UN reform agenda for discussion. The original mandate was clear, humanitarian assistance, development, environment. Go back to the website created at the time of the appointment of the panel, and you will find nary a word that saw women as part of the agenda. In fact, you can't find the word women, period. Nonetheless, the two-pronged strategy paid off. Our colleagues in the Women's Coalition kept up the pressure, and we lobbied with a fierce, near-maniacal intensity. Collectively, it all proved so effective that when the panel reported nine months later in November of 2006, it recommended the creation of a new United Nations International Agency for Women. It was a staggering development, scarce to be believed. And then the real struggle began. Somehow, somehow the nations of the world gathered in the General Assembly of the United Nations had to be persuaded that the recommendation for the new women's agency 
should be implemented. For us, there were three non-negotiable items. First, the new women's agency needed a minimum budget of $1 billion annually, no outrageous sum for half the world's population. And when you ponder the trillions spent by the G8 on stimulus packages and bank bailouts and wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and oil spills and the war on terror, it seems unfathomable that a microscopic smidgen of that wouldn't be put to the use of the world's women. Second, it had to have the operational ability to run programs on the ground, country by country. And third, the choice of Under Secretary General to lead it was crucial. In fact, the most crucial. With those imperatives in mind, there followed an epic saga of lobbying and advocacy uninterrupted over four years' duration. Using the same double-pronged tactics, we kept the pressure on methodically, determinedly, tenaciously, indefatigably, giving countries neither peace nor pause. In fact, every significant ambassador at the United Nations was lobbied in his or her office, often more than once, with a torrent of material and a cacophony of argument. Uh, never have I consumed such quantities of putrid coffee. It's, it's, it's no wonder that WikiLeaks reveals adult brains. <laughs> the process wasn't easy. The United Nations Secretariat at the very top followed a policy of keeping the entire exercise under wraps. The massive media apparatus of the UN was never employed to tell the world what was afoot. The Secretary General made the occasional reference in speeches, but mostly his conduct mirrored his approach to all other issues involving women. An enfeebled rhetorical moment, followed by virtually no implementation whatsoever. Indeed, I dare say that even today, for a majority of this audience, the possible existence of a women's agency is a revelation. But it also wasn't easy for other more obvious reasons. There's a group of countries at the UN, I don't even have to name them, whose misogyny is legendary. For them, the idea of an agency for women with power and resources induced religious, cultural, and political apoplexy. But they lost. They couldn't block. They couldn't impede. They couldn't withstand. The vast majority of countries, when finally forced to face the facts, recognized how abysmal was the United Nations record on gender and were persuaded that something had to be done. On September 2nd last, the Herculean struggle over, the General Assembly of the United Nations voted unanimously not a single dissenting voice to create a new international agency for women. It, it will become operational in 24 days, January the 1st, 2011. For many of us, it's the best thing that's happened to the UN in our lifetime. It might even change the culture of that obtuse, intractable, impenetrable male fortress. <laughs> After September 2nd, the struggle shifted in these last few months to questions of raising money and finding staff with expertise in women's issues. But the truly critical question was who would head the new agency? It is impossible adequately to describe the cascading proliferation of candidates, all of whom were advanced by their head of state, some with credentials, some with no credentials, some on the inside, some on the outside, some government favorites, some whom governments wanted to jettison, some riddled with ambition, some just riddled. Uh, <laughs> whatever that means. But miraculously, in a process totally lacking in transparency, where most of the world didn't even know that the position existed, let alone was open, one candidate transcended all others. Michelle Bachelet, former president of Chile, was appointed a socialist feminist to lead the agency. Who would have thought it possible within the realm of the United Nations? It's amazing that no country had a geopolitical cardiac arrest. <laughs> we could not have done better. Bachelet has a remarkable reputation as a leader. Paula Donovan and I met with her for an intense hour of conversation just yesterday. I don't want to stoke the fires of expectation, 
but I have to tell you that the UN may never be the same. <laughs> Candor. Candor, principle, intelligence, vision, no evidence of paranoia. My God, <laughs> my God, how will the legions of moldy, desiccated bureaucrats cope? <laughs> but let me not get entirely carried away. <laughs> My co-director and I have between us 40 to 50 years of experience with the United Nations. We have no illusions about its six-decade failure to respond to the needs and rights of women. We know that the Secretariat and most of the agencies have a record on gender that is both abject and hypocritical in the extreme. We know that the Security Council pronounces on the agonies of women from Olympian heights and then never follows through. We know that the record of nation states is irrevocably flawed, so let me not pretend that utopia is imminent. But for the first time ever, there is a crescendo of hope. There is a real possibility that under Michelle Bachelet, the United Nations will finally and seriously address the myriad of women's issues that have been allowed to dissolve in a miasma of passivity and indifference. Issues that so compromise the lives women lead whether it's female genital mutilation or sex trafficking or intimate partner violence or child brides or honor killings or the absence of property rights or the absence of inheritance rights or the absence of any rights for that matter or the total lack of economic autonomy or the shocking rates of maternal mortality or the hapless levels of political represent representation or I may say the equally hapless levels of women at the peace table, virtually that has not improved over the last decade, and above all, the ghastly contagion of rape and sexual violence in so many societies. Indeed, perhaps Michelle Bachelet will begin with the most egregious dimensions of the assault on women where the UN has proved criminally delinquent. For example, the desperate, growing, disproportionate infection and death from HIV and AIDS, or the virulent sexual violence in the Congo, Zimbabwe, and now Haiti. What a godsend it would be if that panoply of issues were confronted. It's a tough go. Male hegemony mutates through every corridor of power, political, religious, institutional, academic, let me end with a revealing anecdote from the world of HIV and AIDS. Next year, the School of Public Health at Harvard University, Harvard University, is holding a conference entitled AIDS at 30, the first infections having been recorded in 1981. To plan the conference, Harvard has assembled a so-called Global Advisory Council consisting thus far of 21 members, 19 men and two women. They never, ever learn. The pandemic is a pandemic overwhelmingly of women. The carnage is the carnage of women. The adult women's wards in African hospitals have been scenes of the inferno. Well more than 15 million women and girls dead thus far and an even greater number living with the virus. If anyone understands the past, present, and future of HIV and AIDS, it's women. And yet, you have an advisory council of notables, not mortals, but notables, 19 men and two women. I was invited and refused to be a part of it, so now there are 18 men and two women. <laughs> and that's the never-ending struggle. I know it well. I'm not proud of the fact that I know it well. I, too, have participated in those grotesquely distorted male bastions. It's the instinctive assumption of male entitlement. I've been credited by many for the ultimate creation of the new women's agency. In large measure, I've accepted that credit, the instinctive assumption of male entitlement when it far more appropriately belongs to my co-director. It's a sickness. It's a male pathology. It has to be broken. It curtails the world for women. I say to all of you that while UN Women, as it's called, may not be the salvation, it could be a citadel of enlightenment. 
It's the last best hope we have at this moment in history. Thank you.